It, the Horn of Africa is an incredibly dynamic place. There's an enormous amount of entrepreneurial activity going on, based largely on the livestock production uh, system. There's a huge array of innovations in the pastoral sector. The livestock trade, if you count all of the exchanges of livestock uh, and movements across borders uh, in this area, amounts to about one billion US dollars each year. And this is a phenomenal amount of money in a very, very poor part of the world. Well, it's a region that really is fundamentally misunderstood. It's usually been in the news for the wrong reasons. Um, recent examples of that include the humanitarian crisis and regional drought in 2011, the recent warfare in southern Somalia as well involving foreign militaries and U.S. drone strikes. These often sort of feed an impression that the Horn of Africa is beset by a number of crises that are really insurmountable. What is, what is important is to appreciate that there's a lot of new foreign investment in drylands of the Horn of Africa. There is a lot of new actors as well as old actors who are interested in the development of these areas that we haven't seen before. I think our challenge is that this is giving rise to a lot of new vulnerability as well as, as, as new wealth. Australia has survived uh, different types of shocks over several millennia. Uh, therefore, there's no point to, there, there's no, I don't think there's a need to think that it's going to collapse. But we also need to acknowledge that pastoralism has been facing a lot of pressure uh, from, from, from around it, uh, from conflicts, from uh, state collapses around the, around the region. Uh, from economic hardships, from, from, from uh, variable weather patterns. Despite those pressures, uh, pastoralism and livestock rearing for that matter is, is the most appropriate and most viable way of keeping the, like, the arid and semi-arid lands uh, productive. Some people are really able to make it, uh, cashing in on the, uh, these growing markets and commercialising gaining access to international trade in livestock products. Some people are able to sustain a traditional nomadic livestock production system, a, a classic pastoralism uh, setting. But that's increasingly challenged by land grabs, by climate change, by changes in environment and economy. And so people are also having to seek alternative livelihoods, ones often linked to the livestock economy, but linked to these growing towns, adding value to livestock products and uh, and making profits from a variety of different services. Meanwhile, there's, there are those who are not able to make it, people who are exiting, people who are having to migrate elsewhere. And it's these trade-offs between these different pathways that we have to really think about in thinking forward about the, the policy issues uh, that confront the Horn of Africa. And we argue in the book that we have to focus on the positive elements as well as the negative elements and think about uh, what future pathways for pastoralism in Africa might be. Not all pastoralists, unfortunately, are being helped by these processes. Um, and therefore, what you see often in the Horn is, um, is really a conundrum of, on the one hand, increasing wealth um, and rapid intensification of, of uh, of processes of livestock commercialization in the region happening alongside worsening vulnerability for a great many pastoralists who are not benefiting from the political and economic changes that are, that are taking place. And that really is the core development challenge that we face at the moment is how do we help the majority of pastoralists who are not being helped by these wider political and economic changes that are taking place. Now the book provides many examples at a very local level of pastoralists who are doing things differently um, in partnership with their neighbours, neighbouring communities, with governments and with uh, other development actors such as NGOs and community organisations. We are seeing uh, things like pasture, a new paradigm shift particularly in relation to the 2009 and 2011 road where pastoralists were able to negotiate for their livestock to gain access to national parks. And that has led to the current debate where uh, the wildlife policy, for example, in Kenya is being reviewed to accommodate livestock 
at a particular time of stress. We are having kind of parent, uh, policy discussions where uh, we are trying to strike a balance in between wildlife and livestock uh, correlations in terms of uh, accessing pasture and water. Because we know there is ever increasing heredity, climate change is coming, and also scarcity in terms of land because the practice has been uh, the most productive land in Asal or in pastoral areas is as this, this assumption from the policy making environment that they are more productive if you put if put into other forms of livelihood production. So slowly these innovations are proving that if pastoralism is given the right environment, it can be able to generate it can be able to support a bigger number of people. Very often these areas in the Horn are regarded as marginal. They're marginal to these nation states. Uh, they're on the borderlands, they're on the edge of these countries. But actually, when you think about these places, they're actually at the centre of, of pastoral production. These borders were set up in the colonial era, not really relevant to the trade, reg trade routes and the uh, pastoral production systems that exist across the area. So what we're saying is that if you shift your gaze from the centre, the capital cities, to the margins, then you have a very different view of what pathways are going on and you can uncover a whole array of different alternative pathways which development agencies, policy makers and others need to really take seriously.